Today we continue in the sermon <clears throat> series of Ecclesiastes, and today we are in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. So let's go before God in prayer, and we're going to get right into the sermon this morning. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for all that you give us, and for the opportunity to continue to examine the scriptures that we have in front of us. And Lord, as we look at these today, and as we talk about Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we continue in this idea that we, not, we need to understand where Solomon's coming from in order to get a grip on what he's trying to convey. If not, Father, it's confusing. It could even be depressing. But Lord, we ask that you would be with us and open our mind and heart to hear what you would have us to hear. And help us to remember, Father, that a life without you is not a life at all. As a matter of fact, it's meaningless. But a life with you can completely change everything. So bless us, be with us, and guide us. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. So continuing in our sermon series of Ecclesiastes, we've now covered the first two chapters, which, by the way, as I mentioned already, can be kind of hard to understand and a little bit depressing unless you understand the point from which Solomon is actually teaching. Chapters 1 and chapters 2, we look at the confusion, the meaninglessness, and the hopelessness of a person who is trying to find fulfillment in life without seeking that fulfillment from God. You see, the fact is, without God, it is impossible to find meaning in the redundant of the tick-tock, clickety-clock of the processes that we experience in this world. And without God, you miss not only the meaning of it all, but you also miss seeing his hand of mercy and his hand of grace at work in our life. So I have to ask, and I have asked you to ponder these questions throughout the entire series. One is simply this, can a person know God yet not have him present in his life? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. Think about Cain, King Saul, Ahab, and Jezebel, to name a few names, and maybe even your name. Because you can know God and not have him present in your life. But the second question that I've asked you to ponder is this. Can a person really understand the deeper meaning of life without knowing God? The answer is no. If you are not truly connected with that which is the, uh, the source of all wisdom and knowledge, you cannot know the deeper meaning of life or anything else for that matter. So keep that in mind. But we all know this. People are racing through life full speed ahead and they are trying to fill that hole that's in their life that can only be filled by their creator. And yet, they keep reaching for idols instead. They keep reaching for anything they can find. They will attach themselves to everything that you can think of except God, but no matter how hard you pursue these other things, no matter, what, no matter with which it intensity that you pursue them, you will always be wanting something else when that wears off. And that something else is Jesus, because he's the only one that can fill that desire. So why do we keep listening to the world whisper in our ears, as Solomon's wives once did, I know a God that can offer you something more than your God. Can offer. Solomon had it all at his fingertips, literally. He reminds us of that, that you cannot fill your emptiness with your job. You cannot fill your emptiness with a sport, with a spouse, with a pay raise, with another degree, with yourself, with exercise, with drugs, with sex, with alcohol, with building projects, with busyness. You cannot do that or anything else you can think of. You will not fill your emptiness with those things. The only way that you will ever find real happiness and joy is by the hand of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 25, For without him, who could eat or find enjoyment? Solomon said last week. And we're going to talk about it again this week. To try to find true happiness or enjoyment anywhere else other than the hand of God is like chasing the wind. You'll never catch it no matter how hard you sprint. And even to try to catch it is meaningless. So from today forward, we're going to start noticing that Solomon is going to begin repeating phrases that become familiar to us or have already become familiar to us in the first two chapters, things that we've already actually heard. Now remember, even though we are talking about, you and I are talking about this and it's taken us weeks to get through this series, remember this is really only one conversation that Solomon is having with those who have gathered to hear him speak. Now with that in mind... Also remember that any time we repeat something in the Hebrew, or the Greek for that matter, it insinuates an importance as to what's being said, whether it's one word or whether it is a phrase. So with that, let's continue this morning and see what Solomon is thinking about as we turn, turn, turn towards God 
and the consequences of a world that has tried to live without him. The first thing I want us to see this morning is simply this. There is a time for everything. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 through 8. I hope that you're there and that you'll follow along as I read. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep in mind or keep a, I'm sorry, a time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time for hate. And a time for war and a time for peace. Now what Solomon is doing here is he is presenting to the listener what they call polar opposites. In other words, it insinuates that not only do you and I have to deal with the polar opposites, birth and death, but we also have to deal with everything that comes between the two opposites as well. But what I want us to also notice is that Solomon is explaining what we have to deal with as a consequence to a life that would not follow the instructions of God. You see, these opposing times of life are a result of trying to find a way to live in opposition to God's will. So, can a person know God yet not having present in his life? The answer is yes, but how can that happen? It's called free will. It's called free will, but when we choose to not follow the Lord, there is always a self-inflicted pain that you and I have to face. Again, I want you to think back, if you will, to the Garden of Eden. Consider Adam and Eve before they go rogue against God. They have a place that's completely, they are completely taken care of. Now, we know that Adam was created to tend the garden, but we're not talking about backbreaking work here. Imagine plants that produce vegetables when you needed them. Imagine trees that produce its fruit whenever you need them. Imagine the weather always being the perfect temperature. It's just right. In other words, imagine how the garden must have been when it was in harmony with God and all the harmony was still unbroken. These opposites did not exist. There was no time to die. There was no time to uproot, no time to kill, no time to tear down, no time for a decaying process. There was no time to hate. There was no time for war. Imagine, if you possibly can, a world that was not in crisis because it had pursued something other than the will of God. Imagine that. But the fact is, it's hard to imagine that, isn't it? Because here we are. We are in a place where the consequence of a world and spiritual crisis you and I see the consequences of that. However, even in the fallen state that the world is in, the sovereignty of God is still intact, and therefore, His will be done. Now, you can study the Scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, and you can see how God reigns over all things and over all times, and that He has placed a time for everything under heaven. After you need to consider all the things that's going on, He is omniscient. That means knowing all things all the time. So let me just give you some of the few verses that support this idea. Matthew 8, 29. What do you want from us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come to torture us before the appointed time? John chapter 2, verse 4. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. Acts chapter 1, verse 7. He said to them, meaning Jesus, it is not for you to know the dates or the times that my Father has set by his own authority. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. You see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. You see, even in the case of a fallen world, God still brings about order and an appointed time for every purpose under heaven. Now let me give you two new questions to think about. One is simply this. Do we serve a God that is so sovereign that he would allow man in his free will to do all the evil that he does and yet God can still turn man's evil into something good? And the second question is this. Is our God so powerful that you and I can truly rest in the fact that he is in control and therefore we can fully trust him in any and every situation that he is going to work to the good of those who love him. Now that's two questions you need to consider. 
Consider a few situations, if you would, for a moment. I want you to think about what the worst day in the history of the world was. It's the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Worst day in the history of the world. Here is an innocent man, innocent of any and every crime, let alone every sin, yet he is guilty and beaten without mercy and then nailed to a cross by the testimony of a few liars. Now, I also want you to think about what the best day in the history of the world is from the point of view of a sinner. It's the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Because the fact is it opened the door for sin and death to be defeated and for forgiveness to be made available. Now I want you to think about it. How can the worst day in history also be the best day in the history of the world? It's simple. It happens only by the power and the sovereignty of God. Do you believe that? What about the biblical account of Joseph? Now I'm talking about the coat of many colors, Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers. You could almost hear God whispering in his ear, I got this, do you trust me? When he was put in jail, false accusations of Potiphar's wife, you could almost hear God whisper to him, I've got this, Joseph, do you trust me? When he was raised to the second highest in command over all of Egypt, and Joseph was in control of all the food of the land. You could almost hear God whispering in Joseph's ear, I got this. Do you trust me? Psalm chapter 105, verses 16 and 17, it reads these words, that God called for a famine on the land, and he sent a man ahead, meaning Joseph, who was sold to be a slave. Genesis 45, verses 4 through 7, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers and says, look, I don't want you guys to worry about revenge. I'm not upset. I'm not mad at you at all. Even though you sold me as a slave, Joseph said, it was God who was sending me here that I might not only save millions of lives, but save your lives and our nation as well. In other words, Joseph was saying, my story cannot be told unless it is in the context of God's plan. And even though you, my brothers, meant evil, God in his sovereignty and his power used it to bring about his purpose. It was done so that God would get the glory. Do you believe that? That's the question you have to ask. Or what about the account of Peter? Remember Luke chapter 22, verse 31? Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And when Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, you could almost hear Jesus whispering, I got this, Peter. Do you trust me? And I want you to also notice something that Jesus says to Peter, and that's the last part of the verse, which solidifies that Jesus knows the heart of every man. He says this, and when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. Again, it's as if he's whispering, I got this, Peter. Do you trust me? Allow me to ask two new questions, those ones I just gave you. Do we serve a God that is so sovereign that he can allow man and his free will to do all the evil that he does, and yet God can still turn that evil into something good? Is God so powerful that you and I can fully trust and rest and the, and the fact that he is in control and therefore I can fully trust that he will work every situation to the good of those who love him. You have to wrestle with those questions. Now I believe the key is here. It's right in this. If you fully believe that you serve a sovereign, powerful, and almighty God then that can take man's evil and work it into something good, then it should be reflected in your life. Now, I think that you would agree with that. I mean, the fact is, a true believer does not act one way on Sunday and a different way the rest of the time. A true believer is not one who's vindictive, who's arrogant, who's boastful, who's a gossip, a slanderer, vengeful, pouty, self-absorbed, rude, and you could fill in many other things inside there. I think everyone would agree with that statement. I don't think I need to convince you of that. You see, I don't think... And I don't know how you are living right now at all. But I do know this. I do know that you and Jesus know exactly how you're living. And there is a time for everything. And I believe that God has brought you specifically here today because it is time for you to do an honest evaluation of yourself and ask, where am I spiritually? Remember, there is never a right time to do the wrong thing. And there's never a wrong time 
to do the right thing. You see, there is a time for every purpose under heaven. And maybe today is your time to make things right with God. Which will take us this morning to our next point. And that is simply this. God's fingerprint. I am not at all a fan of Al Franken. I should tell you that before I give you his quote. However, he did once say these words. You cannot change your fingerprints. You only have ten of them. And you leave them on everything you touch. They are definitely not a secret. A water barrier in India had, and by the way, this is a parable. A water bearer in India had two large pots which hang on, hung on each side of a pole that he carried across his neck. One of the pots had a small crack in it and could only deliver half of the water that it went to the master's house each time it went from the water source all the way to the master's house. While the other pot, which was perfect, was able to completely deliver its full portion of water as it walked from the stream or as the man carried it from the stream all the way to the master's house. And for nearly two years, this went on on a daily basis, with the bearer delivering only half of one pot and the full pot of the other one. So the perfect pot was very proud of its accomplishments, while the other one was a bit brokenhearted. But the poor cracked pot, ashamed of its imperfection, was miserable because it could never fully accomplish what it was made to do. After two years of what it perceived as a bitter failure, it spoke one day to the water bearer by the stream. It said these words, I'm ashamed of myself and I want to apologize to you. Well, why? said the water bearer. What are you ashamed of? For two years, I have not been able to deliver all the water that was taken from the river to the master's house. I leak half of it out during the long journey from the river to the house. My flaws rob you of the full value of your effort. And the water bearer felt kind of sorry for the old pot. And so he said with compassion, yes, but as we return to the master's house today, I want you to notice the beautiful flowers along the path. Indeed, as you go up the hill, the old pot looked down and it noticed that there was a warm sun that was a uh, sun that was warming all the beautiful wildflowers on his side of the path, and it did cheer him up a bit. But at the end of the trail, he still felt bad because he had leaked out half of his water yet again, and so again he apologized to the bearer for his failure. But the bearer said to the pot, Did you notice that there were flowers only on your side of the path, not on the one that was perfect? You see, the fact is, I knew you had the flaw, but I took advantage of that flaw. I planted wildflower seeds on your side of the path. Every day as we walk back from the stream, you have watered every one of them. And for two years, I have been able to pick those flowers and decorate my master's table. Without you being just the way you are, he would not have the beauty of those flowers gracing the table of his house. Each one of us has unique flaws. We're all cracked pots. Not we're all cracked pots, but we're all cracked pots. But if we allow the Lord to use our flaws for His grace, then we can actually bring beauty to His table. So if you truly believe that God is sovereign and that God is powerful and you allow Him to whisper in your ear, I got this, do you trust me? Well, then you may begin to bring or begin to have the fingerprints of God show up in your life in a way that you never imagined because you're allowing Him to shape you into who he wants you to be. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He sets eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. See, God has the ability to take all our cracks, all our weaknesses, all our flaws, and turn them into the intended beauty he's always had for you and I. And yes, your life can become a beautiful bouquet on the table of God. But are you willing to allow him to shape you? Are you willing to allow his fingerprints to show up in your life? Now, I don't know which you're going to answer when it comes to that in your life. But for two weeks, we have talked about the fact that there is a hole in your life that can only be filled by God. Nothing else is going to bring you true peace, happiness, or joy like Jesus Christ can. Solomon tells, that, tells us that God has set eternity in our hearts. In other words, deep down inside of us, we all know there is a God. People will deny this all their life. They will say that you use God as a crutch in your life. But oddly enough, even atheists believe in eternity one way or another. 
They don't understand it, but instead of simply seeking a relationship with the Creator God, they seek man-made ways to explain what eternity might look like to them. Many atheists, humanists, and evolutionists simply tell people that we are stardust, that the stars exploded in the sky, and as it fell to the earth, it formed us. We are all energy, and when you die, your energy will be expelled back into the universe, and you will live in eternity as some other form of life. Now, as silly as that sounds, it's actually very much more sad because people are going to hell based on that ideology. Not only do we see God's fingerprints in the life of the saved in Christ, whenever you see good in the world, it's the fingerprint of God because there could be no good without God. The presence of good proves the presence of God. When we read about the heroics and the humanity of people, first responders and regular citizens during recent hurricanes and Las Vegas killings, when people jump into the line of fire and do all kinds of tremendous things for people that they do not even know, there is a fingerprint that whispers to you and I what man means for evil, I can use for good. Do you trust me? When you see the beauty of the trees in the fall, the laughter of your friends and family, the unbridled joy of the smile on a child's face, and the colors of the sunrise and the sunset, when you, when you look at the largeness of the night sky and the trillions of stars, you see the fingerprint of God. When you read about his salvation and his love, you see his fingerprint clearly. When you see life that has been completely transformed, forged in the fires of life's trials, and yet in Christ, they are as strong as steel. You see the fingerprints of God yet again. When we read 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. We see the fingerprint of God. Solomon then adds these words in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 14. I know that everything that God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing can be taken away from it. God does this so men will revere him. In other words, brothers and sisters, God wants his fingerprint to be so evident in all that you see that we will praise and honor him and give him the glory. But the more I see the fingerprint of God and the more I take notice when it's there, the more I see it missing when evil and hatred and God-haters and so many other vile things in this world take place. It's so easy then to see how God's fingerprint has been wiped away by man's choice. Which will lead us this morning to our last point. Things don't seem fair. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 16 and 17 says, And I saw something else under the sun. In place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. I thought, which by the way said means reasoned. I reasoned in my heart. God will bring to judgment both the righteous and the wicked. For there will be a time for every activity, a time for every deed. Solomon is reminding his listeners, both then and now, by the way, even speaking of you and I, that in the world that has chosen a path where God is not the standard of ethics and morality, and because of that, what we we should expect is not always what we get. And when we don't get that, we want to cry foul. We want to complain. But why do we expect the world, why do we expect the world to do moral things when it is an immoral place? Why do we expect a place to act godly when it is completely godless? Why in the world would we ever expect that? When we look at the world and we see someone like Adolf Hitler and we see all the atrocities that he brought, not only to his own countrymen, but also to the entire world, it seems unfair. It seems unjust. When we read about human traffickers who kidnap children and then sell them into a very much alive and well slave market where they are abused to death either by way of sex slave or forced labor, it seems unfair. It seems unjust. When we read about legalized abortion rate in the United States where 1.4 million abortions happen every single year to innocent children, we scream out in our own mind, it isn't fair. It isn't just. 
And when we see how many lives have been lost due to terror and ideologies that are false, like Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, the mafia, gangs, drug runners, it just doesn't seem fair. It seems unjust. And it is. However, this is the reality of a world that does not care to have a relationship with its creator. We live in a world that is corrupt, that is vile and violent and has evil in all it does. It is sad. And that is why it is so easy to notice the fingerprint of God when it is there. But Solomon then adds this, Ecclesiastes 3, 18 through 20. I also thought, as for men, God tests them so that they will see that they're like the animals. Man's fate is like that of the animals, and the same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All of them have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the animal. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to the dust they shall return. When you remove God from the equation of your life, when you do not have God as your maker and as your creator, you make yourself no different than the animals, which means a non-thinking being. Now, I want, to take this, I want you and I to both take notice in chapter 2. Solomon compared a person who did not think too much about their own life or about their future. He referred to them as a fool, which is a person who doesn't think much about anything at all. As if you remember, folly is the opposite of wisdom. In other words, a person, uh, who, uh, one who is a person of folly is one who does not think much about anything at all. Therefore, the Bible refers to a person of folly as a fool. Psalm chapter 14, verse 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. In other words, you're not doing thinking too well. But when you do not care about your relationship with the Lord, you, like a fool or like the animals, have the same fate. We're all going to die. We're all made of dust. And to the dust we will all return. And the same fate awaits us all, at least for mankind. You see, when you live your life with God absent from it, it is meaningless. Because we know that man will face the judgment. And that is where we differ from the animals. Verse 21, it's a rhetorical question in nature. In other words, the wise already know the answer. In verse 21, it reads these words. Who knows if the spirit of man rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. God knows the difference because God is the judge. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, just as a man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 22, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, away from me, you evildoer. Sometimes, while we're here on this earth, things do not seem fair. People are treated bad. People act foolish. People commit vile acts against others. We want to see fairness. We want to see justice. But we may not see that while we're here because we live in a fallen world. The fact is, justice will come in the end. There is a time for justice. When we stand before God, it is at that point that I will thank God for his grace and for his mercy and for his love. It is at that point that I will thank God for the fact that he is not fair with me, that he took all my burdens upon himself. Now, I want you to think about that. What was fair about the cross of Calvary? Nothing, because Jesus was innocent. But that's not what mattered to him when he was going through all he did. What mattered to him was you and I. Not fairness, you and I. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Who for the joy set before him. What joy? We're talking about the cross. The most torturous form of punishment. Even in today's standards. What joy are we talking about? Well the joy was you and I. The joy was all of us. The opportunity to be saved. That was the joy 
set before him. But it certainly was not fair. No, at all. It wasn't. It was grace. You see, friends, to God, you and I are not like the animals at all. We were created in his image. Why? Because he loves us so much. You are not meaningless. Your life is not meaningless. You matter to Jesus very much. So much, he endured the cross for you. So let me ask you today, can people see the fingerprints of God in your life? I don't know that answer, but you do. Maybe there's a time for you to make things right with God. Friends, I invite you today to accept the grace of God by faith in what he did for you at Calvary's cross. And at Christian baptism, bury your old self and arise as a brand new person in Christ Jesus, knowing that you've made a turn in your life, that you've gone from being opposed to him because it doesn't matter what you think about him. If you're not saved, you're in opposition. That you've gone from being opposed to him to being for him. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die. There's also a time to be saved, and maybe today is that day for you.